just say thank you, each of you, for being here, mostly for being part of Occupy. It's pretty exciting to me that over 12 weeks' time, such an amazing uh, expanse of movement and ideas has happened and that I've gotten to be on the planet at the same time as this. It makes me very, very, very happy. And I'm always glad to be in Springfield, so aptly named, you know, when you come down here in the springtime and red buds and dogwoods and these lime green leaves, it really is quite a beautiful time to be here, so I'm very, very pleased about that too. Um, I'll just quickly tell a story that might be a little bit biographical about me, I suppose, before I talk about o Occupy Afghan Airwaves. Um, uh, I, taught in, I taught the Harrison Gents and the Latin Kings in Chicago for some time after leaving a kind of posh Jesuit school. And um, there was a point when we were having more funerals than graduations. It was very hard for those young kids to survive their teenage years. And I think that was mainly because of poverty. So I and a number of people in what you might call the do-gooders ghetto, we, we just, we couldn't any longer go along like this was normal. And I can't give you any logical connection here, but what we decided to do was to plant corn on top of nuclear missile silo sites. If I were to do it today, I wouldn't plant corn at something else. There's enough corn in this world. But, um, so I just want to quick tell you about the day. I went out and planted corn on top of intercontinental ballistic missile silo sites. It was another beautiful day. Summertime, mist was rising, crickets were creaking, birds were chirping. My heart was thumping, as I'd never done this before. And I knew that 14 of my friends were doing something similar, and I was really mostly afraid I wouldn't make it over the barbed wire fence, like get stuck on top of barbed wire and be impaled. And so I got on the other side, and I hung my big banner that said, Farms, Not Arms. We really thought the farmers would understand land was meant to grow corn and wheat, not to plant weapons of mass destruction. And, and um, I pulled out my five pink pellets of corn and planted them, and it was kind of my first and almost only agricultural act. And then... Um, I went and sat on top of the lid of this intercontinental ballistic missile. It was making a sound like this. And my heart calmed down, and I probably hummed a little tune. And then I saw a big vehicle speeding down the country road, and it skidded to a stop, and there were gravel and stones flying. And out climbed four men in full military garb with combat boots and helmets and walkie-talkies and rifles and camouflage. And they surrounded the perimeter of the site, and um, one of them was crouched down, and he said, all personnel, please leave the site, clear the site. And I thought I was going to do just what they said, because this was kind of new for all of us. So hands in the air, step to the left, step to the right. And I thought, oh, please don't make me climb that fence in front of you. And they had the key. So they opened it up, and I was handcuffed and told to kneel down, and I kind of made a note to self, never wear shorts if you do this again, <laughs> grasshoppers and stuff. And then... Um, well, three of the soldiers got in the vehicle and took off. I think maybe to try and figure out what does chapter two of the manual say to do, because this was new for all of us. And they left one soldier with his gun, I mean, not on my head, but certainly in my direction. And I am kind of preternaturally extroverted. I think I lasted about a minute and a half in silence. And then I just started talking and I told, the soldier, without looking at him, pretty much what I just told you. And then I asked him, do you think the corn will grow? And he said, I don't know, ma'am, but I sure hope so. So then I asked him, do you want to say a prayer? Yes, ma'am. So I quick chose a memorized prayer. Lord, make me a channel of your peace. Where there is darkness, let me sow light. Where there is sadness, joy. Where there is despair, hope. Master Grant, that I may not seek so much to be consoled as to console, to be pardoned as to pardon, to be loved as to love with all my soul. Amen. And then he asked me, Ma'am, would you like a drink of water? And like I said, I never turned around, so I can't quite tell you what happened next. I said, yes, please. And then he asked me, Ma'am, would you please tip your head back? <laughs> and I did. And I can still feel that water dribbling down my chin. And that soldier taught me a lot that morning. Maybe the manual says keep your prisoner fed in water, but I'll bet it doesn't say put your gun down to do it. And the others could have come back in the vehicle. It's just soon, bless you, Lindsay. Anyway, that soldier, in order to perform an act of kindness for a complete stranger, I had to seem strange, took a risk, I think. And... 
When you're older, you kind of get to have bookends. And uh, a bookend in my life is that I was in Baghdad all through the shock and Doha bombing, and it was shocking and it was awful. We didn't have any idea what's happened to Saddam Hussein, where is his government, where is his army, is anybody in charge? And it would happen in my city in Chicago when nobody's in charge. People often call looters decide, well, why wait? Windows were being broken, things were being stolen. We had stuff to steal. We had, as Americans, living in this small family-owned hotel. We had money, and we had a satellite phone, and we had passports that were very valuable, and we had um, you know, all kinds of cameras. And so we thought, if the looters get here, we're now jeopardizing the people we were living with. And what if the looters you know, take people hostage and guns start firing? And, so I was begging the hotel manager, don't pull out a gun, whatever you do. We all signed forms. We said if we got taken hostage, we'd understand. And all of a sudden, little Dima, she was Lindsay's age, and she was eight years old. And I, I just love this child so much because she would look up at her father, and, and she would have such shame and guilt in her face because the bombing had terrified her so much that she'd lost control of her bladder. And so she'd be standing in a pool of her own urine apologizing to her father. And you just wanted to say, honey, it's okay. We're all scared shitless. But um, she had seen first sign of what she called Junud, Askaria, military. And so she came speeding down the hallway to tell us, and we all ran up to the second floor balcony. And as far as you could see, armor personnel carriers, Jeeps, Humvees, bulldozers, all painted in the same color beige. Life has its contradictions. I have to tell you, I was one relieved pacifist. The Marines got there first. And there then commenced many days of extraordinary conversations between the Marines and the pacifists. We'd put ourselves there to try to say, well, we can't leave friends who befriended us all through these long years of economic sanctions. But of course, the Iraqis had taught us hospitality that would not quit. And so I was sort of looking at my friend Cynthia. I'm holding one end of the banner and she's got the other. And I said, Cynthia, they look kind of thirsty down there, don't they? And Cynthia, she's 75 years old, code pink hat and war is not the answer t-shirt. She dropped her end of the banner and said, of course that's the right thing to do. I'm so glad you said that. And she walked over to where we had many stacks of bottled water, and Cynthia picked up two heavy six-packs of water and went trudging down to bring water to the newly arrived Marines. And I was just kind of standing there gobsmacked, and like I'm a statue or something, thinking, well, shouldn't we have a consensus meeting first? And <laughs> then I said, I said, no, Cynthia's doing the right thing. Every Iraqi family had given us water, given us tea, said come in, sit down, hold our children, sleep on our rooftops. And so I just went and got some water and I remember I left dates under the bed and I went down to see who's there and walked up to two Marines. And one of them said, thanks ma'am, how do you eat this? Meaning the dates. I said, just take a fistful. And then he said, my name's Tom, this here's Jerry. Yep, our names are Tom and Jerry. We're from uh, Indiana, you could call us Hoosiers, ma'am. You want to see a picture of my kids? And so it goes. Um, that's part of history for me of not always being quite sure what to expect. I'll never budge. I'll never, 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 never budge from believing that wars are always counterproductive and futile. Wars always accelerate our financial decline. War should never be fought. Children should never be ripped apart. Explosions should never happen. I hate violence from the bottom of my being. I want to do battle with violence, but I want to do it nonviolently and somehow express anger and agitation, but do it with compassion and empathy if it's possible. So I was so happy to entitle this talk and that you've come makes me happy, but to call it um, occupying Afghan airwaves, because I've learned so much from these Afghan kids lately. I mean, I've taught high school for a long time. I've always liked teenagers, but these ones are so extraordinary. And so I thought maybe, um, believing a picture can speak a thousand words, let me just show you some Afghan youngsters. Um, and I hope this will cooperate. <laughs> she said. All right, let's just hope 
that if I go down here, what was that trick you showed me? Use this? Go back up, I think. Go back up? With the, the cursor. Oh. Uh, With the arrow key on your keyboard. Huh? Oh, I'm so stupid, I can't believe myself. Oh, there we go. Aha. Uh -huh. No, that's... <coughs> Sorry, I need more advice. What am I doing wrong? I think you just have to go up for it. Maybe. Ah, oh, I got you. You're right, you're right, you're right. Me a little faith, okay. What's netbooks? have very small resolution. Yeah, they're cheap. That's, yeah. <laughs> so, um, I hope this will work. If it does, I think I want to make it full screen. Maybe the email, maybe the internet connection isn't so great. Um, so th um, the Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers are coordinated by a man who's a medical doctor, and he's from Singapore. His name is Hakim. He just goes by the name Hakim. And I, you know, I don't know if this is actually going to work. Maybe the internet strength isn't so great. What do you think? Because that looks kind of slow, doesn't it? I was—I got so spoiled being over at the university. Everything was kind of, <laughs> yeah. huh? Well, um, while we're waiting, maybe I can just <laughs> tell you. Oh, there we go. How do we get sound? Just <laughs> Ah, never thought of that one. So there's no microphone we could maybe put over here for sound? We don't have any speakers or Can you hear that? Oh no. <laughs> uh, the internet I think it's going to be far too slow. The internet connection is going to be too slow, huh? Well, I thought this gizmo would do it. Could she just pause it and talk and then when it's mm -hmm. fully loaded, she can... Yeah, is that the way it works? Yeah. yeah, pause it, go ahead, continue talk, and when it's fully loaded, you can hit it. Okay, so I'm going to start with pause. Huh? It's about to pause again. I, I, where do you, how do you find the pause button? I think just the space bar. Yeah, oh, I got you. Okay. Right. okay. It's not the most flattering facial feature of that child. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what, I'm very, very cynified, and um, I very rarely have had a chance to be in some place that's not city. But one way for me to learn more from people from Afghanistan has been to try to understand more about people who live in villages, and it's also given me some of the insights into the United States War. So I'll just offer you a few anecdotes. Uh, um, there are 10,000 villages in Afghanistan, 354 provinces and 50, uh, sorry, 354 districts and 34 provinces, but primarily it's a very rural agricultural area. So um, you can probably remember uh, for yourselves when the first ones from a family go to university, it's a big deal. And can you imagine from rural Afghanistan with all the corruption in the education, when somebody finally makes it to the university, this for a village is a source of great huge pride, and for a family it's like those are our... So the Namati family had two, Ismail and Burunullah, who both went to the Kabul University and they were enormously proud. And in a Muslim family, at the time of Ramadan, Everybody gets together. Everybody comes together for a family meal because this is celebration. This is very much a, a time of uh, getting the entire clan together, basically. So as it had happened, in the village where the Namati family lived, two Taliban fighters had come the day before, not only into their village, but they went to the first house where they thought they could knock on the door and seek something to eat and some, some water. Well, in that culture for hundreds of years, as far back as anyone can remember, when somebody knocks at the door, you can't say, well, 7-Eleven is over there or Motel 6 is down there. When people ask you for hospitality, you give it. Plus, if they're armed Taliban people, you double give it because you don't <laughs> want to have them come back and blow you up. So people gave whoever came to the door something. 
Now the very huge misfortune is that it seems likely, looking back in retrospect, that the people who came to the door were appearing on the screen of people in a dimly lit trailer in the Creech Air Force Base in Nevada, where Air Force pilots who will never, I'm just going to pause a moment and say thank you for coming. My name is Kathy Kelly. Hi again, Laura, and I'm just presenting about um, village life and drones and um, night raids. I didn't tell you about the night raids, but here. So, the Namati family, and we, we have some more chairs, uh, don't we? Yeah, there's chairs right here. More chairs, if anyone likes. Chairs? <laughs> so anyway, we're talking about the Namati family, and in the village, two Taliban fighters had come through the previous day. So they appear on the screen of people whose job as analysts of footage that's being collected by drones that fly overhead in Afghanistan, and I'll just do a quick factoid footnote. The Air Force says it requires 65 to 70,000 analysts being paid a full year's salary to scrutinize all of the information collected by these drones flying overhead. And that information amounts to 58,000 full-length feature films. So the Rand Corporation says, really, you'd need 100,000 analysts to adequately study who's going where and establish patterns of life in Afghanistan. Now to tell you the truth, just thinking about this sends my Irish temper over the roof. Because I want to say, you want to understand patterns of life in Afghanistan. You get your plane ticket or I'll give you my frequent flyer miles, let's go. And I'll show you patterns of life in Afghanistan. And I'll show you patterns of life so you'll understand you don't burn the Quran, you don't urinate on the corpses, and you don't go out and do killing sprees that cost the lives of 16 innocents. But, okay, let's put that off to the side a moment. Irish temper back now. And so you've got people in Creech Air Force Base whose job is to analyze who's going where. And they see that two people the previous day had come into the village and they've identified them as Taliban. And then all of a sudden, two more people, young men, go to the same house and could potentially be Taliban. So they don't bomb the house right away. They organize a night raid. The surveillance information is given to the United States Joint Special Operations Forces, and their job then is to get the armor personnel carrier and the Humvees and the Jeeps and be ready to bust into the house and maybe take people away to prison, or maybe if they're pretty sure that these are their guys, just kill them right away because they become like the executioners and the jurors and the judge all wrapped into one. So the two boys have come back to be with their family, but because they're such good students, they go to the family guest room quarters and they study for the rest of the night after the dinner is over. They fall asleep over their books. At 1 o'clock in the morning, they're awakened, and in have come United States Joint Special Operations Forces, warriors, Navy SEALs, Green Berets, Marine Rangers. These are the most well-trained warriors on the planet. They're inside the Namadi house. Their guns are pointed. Ismail tries to say because he speaks some English, please, we are students, and, but the... Americans aren't quite sure what he's saying and then they shoot because they think he's trying to resist. And then the other two brothers got up and they were shot. There are three pools of blood in the room. The 13-year-old was spared and he was the eyewitness. Meanwhile, on the other side of the house, they've awakened another brother and they put a bag over his head already and their Afghan translator is whapping him in the face, just slapping him right across the face. Tell, tell, where are the guns? Where are the guns? And this brother is saying, Believe me, if you find a gun here, you'd bring it here and shoot me. He doesn't yet know that they've shot his three brothers. The village is up in arms. These are the two boys that went to university that you've just killed, and their brother 
فرحی بلا اسم ایر برنولا And then the United States military realized, whoop, we made a mistake. And they apologized. Some of you can probably remember in your own lives what a big deal it was to go on a family vacation. And the Kelly family, quite honestly, we never got beyond Kittyland and Brookfield Zoo. <laughs> we never went out of state, but even that was pretty exciting. So, footnote. In Noah's life in Bamiyan, or in Panjshir, these are the places I've visited that are most rural, it's typical for a woman to be able to go to the marketplace, which is 35 minutes walking downhill, once a year. All right, I would have a very hard time being a woman in Afghanistan. Once a year you leave the village and it's a 35 minute walk? So the, can you imagine in the Daikundi province the excitement when the decision was made by village elders, no doubt, that there would be a three-car convoy, think like big SUVs, that would travel not only outside the village but all the way through the neighboring Uruzgan province into Kandahar, they'd go to the big, huge market in Kandahar <coughs> and then go up to the capital of Afghanistan, Kabul to get medical care for some of the grandmothers and infants that needed medical care. And so it was mostly women and children and grandmothers in a three-car convoy taking a trip that must have seemed almost out of this world to the passengers. Well, they had no way of knowing when they set forth that when they got to the Uruzgan province, about 12 miles away, an airborne United States vehicle, military vehicle, had dropped paratroopers, about six paratroopers, onto the ground, and they were doing a light recon mission. And back in Nevada, there were operators whose job it was to study the screen to get patterns of life in Afghanistan, but most especially to make sure there wasn't any pattern of anybody coming along who might kill these U.S. paratroopers or harm them in any way. So the drone operators and the guy that's watching the console, the screen, are watching very, very carefully that there are no insurgents, there are no so-called bad guys, and all of a sudden they see the convoy. Three unidentifiable cars are coming down a mountain road, and maybe if they intersect with these paratroopers, they might harm them. And so the question becomes, do you implode the convoy? And so the drone operators suddenly have to try and figure out what is this convoy all about. So there's so much information coming in. You've got four drones and four teams analyzing the data from the drones, and the kill chain has been invoked because there's not much more time. The convoy's getting closer and closer to where the paratroopers are. So the decision was made. You can't take the risk. The convoy has to be attacked. The first car blows up. The women in the second car hop out. They tear off their long scarves at the butchers. They're waving them in the air. Civilians, civilians! That car blows up. The third car wasn't attacked. There was one drone operator who had seen on his screen, there, there, it looks like a grandmother, it looks like a child. And he was trying to get his message up to the top of the kill chain. Don't shoot, don't attack, civilians. And the New York Times described it as being like a lost email. He didn't get his message up to the top of the kill chain. And it's really more like lost lives. Village life. Some of the youngsters I've grown to know are such hard workers. I, I first went to <coughs> Afghanistan as a guest of the Italian uh, hospital, the Emergency Surgical Center for Victims of War. And there was one nurse, Felipe, and he used to say to me, Allora, che mi immagino? Here you give me the money we give Italia every day until he gives to Afghanistan to be able to uh, keep the war. You give it to me, I make amusement park. Yes, because these little children, they work so hard. Can you imagine they work all the day? They never get a day off. If they get the day off from school, still they go out to the fields. I build amusement park, let them play. Allora, I fall in love with these children. And I am right with Felipe in love with these kids. So hard workers, and little Zekrula, you'll see him on the video, I hope, gets up at 2 o'clock in the morning, several times a month, gets on a donkey, rides six hours, sometimes along very icy mountainous roads. He's probably hugging the donkey for warmth. 
and then gets off the donkey, collects as much scrap wood, firewood, twigs, branches, tumbleweed, whatever he can get, puts it into the sacks on either side of the donkey, often he's accompanied by a couple friends, rides back another six hours, offloads the content of the sacks onto the rooftop of the mud hut that he shares with his family, then goes out to get water for himself and the neighbors, and then plant potatoes, harvest potatoes if it's springtime or summer weather, and then try to find the energy by candlelight because there's no electricity to maybe see if he could study a little bit and stay in school. And that's Sekarula, one of the brightest, wisest people on the planet I've ever met. Well, Zekarullah's counterparts are all over Afghanistan in rural areas going out to the mountainside. Some kids collect scrap metal. I've met little ones in the hospital. Uh, Adi Dula had lost three fingers in his eye because he thought he'd really gotten the treasure. He had found a landmine, and if he could open it up and extract the brass, then he could really make a lot of money for his family. And it exploded in his hand and took off three fingers in his eye. But I'm thinking particularly of March 1st. And again, I want us to remember that these drones are supposed to be able to even like read license plates in some cases or be able to see footprints on the ground. So the drone operators are supposed to know the terrain and be able to establish patterns of life. They're getting paid big money to do this, right? So on March 1st, youngsters like Sekarula, but in the Kunar province, were out on the mountainside. They'd finished collecting all of the firewood they could stuff into the sacks. They were getting ready to mount their donkeys, go back to their households, and all of a sudden two combat brigade unit U.S. helicopters flew overhead. Now when you think of these helicopters, think about an Abrams tank. It's one of the biggest tanks in the U.S. arsenal. And the engine is loud and enormous, and that's exactly the same engine that is put in these combat brigade unit <laughs> helicopters. The United States has just ordered 150 more of them from Colorado Springs to fly over the skies of Afghanistan. Two of them fly over the mountainside in Kunar, over the Petch River Valley, and one of them went up very, very high, and there was a bright green, lime green flash, and all of a sudden the guns came out. Think of me, I massacre every one of the eight children on the mountainside was shot dead. There was one who survived. He was 13 years old. A tree cracked in half and it had already begun to leaf. And so the leafy branches saved this kid that he couldn't be seen. And the parents, they hear the explosions on the mountainside and they're running up to try to see, is it what it sounds like it was? And then they found the bloodied and dismembered bodies of their sons, their sons, their sons. And the survivor told what happened. And General Petraeus was in charge of the U.S. forces at that point. He apologized the next day. But you know and I know that since the Vietnam War, the United States has tried very, very hard to make it seem that we're waging a humanitarian war. That by and large, people in Afghanistan are better off. They're better off because if we weren't there, the Taliban would be there and the Taliban would be worse and we're civilized and we're trying to bring them democracy. We're trying to bring them our civilized values. So how civilized are we? May I quote for you January 19, 2011. General Petraeus was still in charge of the International Security Assistance Forces. And he was so exultant over a particular press conference where it seemed like the military was finally really getting the upper hand. We've heard this so many times, don't quit now, we're getting the upper hand. We're get so he's exultant and he says, we've got our teeth in their jugular and we're not going to let go now. How civilized are we? We've got our teeth in their jugular. Vampire, flesh-eating vampire language. Don't sound so civilized to I me. Mean, I'm not wild about Buffy either. Sorry. I should have left Buffy out of it. <laughs> anyway, how civilized are we? Um, a month later, President Hamid Karzai of Afghanistan is beside himself, calls the International Security Assistance Forces, top brass, and General Petraeus to the presidential palace, and says, you've got to do something about these night raids and civilian killings. The people are up in arms, and these aerial bombardments have to stop. 66 people were killed yesterday. And General Petraeus and his top brass said, no, 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 no. Those were not 66 civilians. Our report has already investigated 
There were seven civilians and all of the rest were insurgents or supporters of insurgents. So Hami Kausai's aides come out with pictures of children. And they said, what about these injured children? And General Petraeus said, well, you know, that's how Afghan parents sometimes discipline their children. They burn them. They boil them. So, I mean, that went out in Afghan news. People were furious. Who are these Americans that suggest that we burn or we boil our children for discipline. And so to kind of be a flag catcher, Petraeus had to send his top public relations guy over to try and put out the rage. And the guy said the same thing again. <laughs> he said, well, what General Petraeus meant to say was that that's sometimes how the parents discipline their children. What do you do with people like this? So then on March 1st, when there was an eyewitness, General Petraeus apologized. But we hear the same thing again and again and again. This tragic event should never have happened. Well, that's true. But it happened again two weeks later. Kids are cleaning out an irrigation ditch and they're shot dead in cold blood. We know that it happened just so very recently with the guy who was assigned as a sniper to the Joint Special Operations Force Base. He's been through three tours of duty in Iraq. He's had brain damage. And he's assigned to be the sniper to protect these guys who must walk like you know gods through his life. They're the special trained warriors. And I mean, it's true. March 8th, three days earlier, an improvised explosive device had been planted by hostile insurgents and blew up a military vehicle. And some people lost their legs. And I'm very sorry to tell you that. So the person who's the sniper who's supposed to protect the people at the base thinks he should go out and engage in revenge. That's what the villagers think happened. In fact, most of the villagers think it was more than one person. But the United States makes it sound like this is one bad apple, this is an aberration, this isn't the way things really are. Since 2001, without provocation and without cause, the United States military have been bursting into homes, flying over, farmland, and killing innocent civilians. The Taliban kill more, but that doesn't make our warfare right. That doesn't mean that anybody in this country is going to be more secure. In fact, as people send the cell phone messages out all throughout the land, this bloody thing has happened again. The desire for revenge increases, and the proliferation of our drones makes it more plausible that people could engage in good for the goose, good for the gander, hmm, targeted assassinations. Two billion dollars a day the United States spends on this war. When I was over there most recently, it was so cold. The pipes froze. We didn't have access to electricity because that's always sporadic. So to tell you the truth, I mean, this isn't terribly couth, I suppose, but if you wanted to take a dump, you had to first eye a pile of snow. Think to yourself, how long will it take us to melt that snow so that I'll have enough water to flush my own waste material down a hole because people have stand-up toilets and it's kind of like an outhouse. <laughs> and if there's no running water, and you can't clean and you can't get rid of your wet. It's like cholera waiting to happen. And I was one of the lucky ones. I've got a roof over my head. I mean, it was freezing cold and we all stayed in one room, morning, noon, and night, studied, ate, slept, everything in one room, uh, 12 of us, and that was fine. But the people who don't have a roof over their head, because of the war, there are 400 new refugees every day. Every day, 400 new refugees. Can you imagine Chicago with 400 new refugees coming in every day? Well, Kabul's built for 500,000 people. It's now got 5 million people living there. And because the government doesn't want more people to come and stay, they forbid the new refugees to dig for wells, so they'll have water, or dig latrines. Cholera again. And then they have these makeshift houses made out of mud and plastic and sticks. And so during the time that I was there, there were 26 people who froze to death in Kabul alone. And 22 of them were children. And of that number, I believe, at least eight were under five years of age. They were little infants who like rolled out from under the blankets that the parents had 
trying to keep themselves warm because how could they ever get firewood? They couldn't send a kid out to the mountainside and they sure didn't have the money to buy firewood. So they just you know, sleep huddled together under blankets with freezing temperatures. But if the little one falls out from under the blanket, the little ones don't know to cry. And so I have been to see one particular family. And the first time I went, just for warmth, I huddled next to little Jumabu. And her father had unzipped the top of her jacket so that I'd see that the sleeve was armless. And she'd been hit by a drone. And next to her, her brother was writhing in pain in kind of the fetal position, and his leg had been hit by the same drone attack. And so the family couldn't wait around to see if this would happen again. They just up and out and moved, as has happened with so many families. Either they're afraid they'll be hit again, or they're afraid somebody will accuse them of being informants. And so the whole family moves. And so this family moved to this wretched, squalid refugee camp. And I got back home, and I opened up the New York Times, and I read that there were more children who'd frozen to death, including their eight-month-old baby. Civilized. A civilized nation would pay reparations. Little Gulamai, who's part of the Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers, he's 13, he's the youngest, he was so excited. He had a conversation with Noam Chomsky. <laughs> and these kids had been practicing and reading their questions, and then they got Noam Chomsky on the phone. And Gulamai, his question was, Prof Noam, do you think Americans should pay reparations? <laughs> Noam Chomsky just lit up. Oh, I'm so glad you asked that question. That's a very good question. And Chomsky said yes, and then he went through, you know, like 20 minutes of how any civilized nation would pay reparations. So when people ask, what's the answer? Take that $2 billion that's being spent every week and uh, analysts whom I trust who were analyzing during the Vietnam War, like Alfred McCoy, have said it would cost, in order to reseed the orchards with mulberry and pistachio and walnut trees, in order to rebuild the irrigation systems, and in order to replenish the flocks, the price tag he thinks would be about $34 billion. And I think, oh my God, try and tell $34 billion in this climate with this economy. $34 billion is 17 weeks of the war. I don't want to pay for one minute of the imperialist warfare that the United States is waging. I can't and I won't and I don't. So I wonder, could we try segueing into this and see I if it it's works? probably loaded now. Yeah, all right, let's try one more time. If not, I, I know how to say it. So, and how was I going to get sound on this? I think it's just going to be as loud as the computer. Okay, there might be some sound thing though. It's part of it is my eyes are dead. Okay, that's at the side of it. Okay. Should that work though? I'm just clicking the little screen. If you click the screen, it will start. Yeah, right in the middle. Can I turn down the light?
Child to be charmed by. Uh, I don't know if you could catch that. She was just cutting her spring onions and <coughs> telling about her brothers and sisters. Her brothers were all killed or dead, or rather dead. And um, she had another sister that got her little sixth finger caught under the door. She's just a very enlightening child. Um, so I'd, I'd just like to uh, do one more. Um, There's another one that I wanted to show you of my young friend Zekrula, but all of these videos are available. You can just go to um, a website called OurJourneyToSmile.com. The Singaporean doctor, uh, the friend of mine, Hakim, uh, started out doing his relief work on the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan, and he, he befriended a young child who was a rag picker and an orphan. And uh, the kid thought, well, maybe I could do better in Iran, so he wanted to go off to Iran, and Hakim said to him before he left, let me take your picture. And then he said, smile, as you would say, and the grandmother overheard that, and she read him the riot act. How dare you tell this child to smile? This child has never had anything to smile about and never will. And so Hakim gulped, and then he created this website that's dedicated to the idea that we all have a responsibility to assure that every child in this world has some reason to smile. So that's that website. Um, I would maybe like you to uh, just take a little bit of time to go to um, Just a little bit more on Afghanistan. I, I happened to have a chance to be over in Australia, and, and Hakim was with me. And he said to these Australian kids in one of the like most posh schools in Australia, it was a great school. Does anybody know where Afghanistan is? And this little kid said, I know, I know, I know, North Africa. <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> um, and I think you know, people often say that war is God's way of teaching geography to American people. And so I want to say that back in 1990, before I went to Iraq, I could spell Kuwait. And if you gave me some time, I could find Iraq on a map. But I was dumb as a door about Central Asia and the Middle East. And um, well, that persists. You know, I, I uh, um, Probably the most courageous thing I ever did in going over to Iraq was to get on the Archer Avenue bus in Chicago and go home and tell my mother what I was about to do. <laughs> it's a total non-starter. Um, and, and my mother's line had been, after I'd been there all through the 2003 shock and awe bombing, and she just never could understand, what is her daughter peeling off and going to Iraq back and forth and back? And I went there 27 times to break the economic sanctions. But when I stayed there during the shock and awe bombing, I mean, then my family knew where I was, and they were seeing it on TV. They were really, really worried. 
So my mother was glad to have me home in one piece, but she realized I was really distraught. Well, I was pretty upset because I could see where things were going in Iraq and that things were just going to get worse and worse and worse. And sort of trying to comfort me, my mother said in her thick Irish brogue, Kathy, dear, what you don't understand is that the people of Iraq could have gotten rid of Saddam Hussein a long time ago, and they ought to have done it, and they didn't. So we went in there and did it for them, and they ought to be grateful, and they're not. Case closed. My mother, a combination of Irish charm and mother wit and Fox News. <laughs> so never mind that I've been back and forth and back and forth. My family all listen to my mother. <laughs> Um, and Americans tend to be like that. If we can think that it's a humanitarian war, it's been in our history ever since, you know, genocide against the first people that lived here, um, people like to say, well, we're taming the savage wilderness. <laughs> we're giving them the benefit of our civilized ways. And then when we got all the way to the frontier and there wasn't any more wilderness to tame after we'd taken all the land away, then, well, there's the Philippines, well, there's Korea, well, there's Vietnam, and now, you know, maybe we're going to tame Iran. And so if we can say, well, you've got this horrible dictator, Muammar Gaddafi, you need us. You've got Saddam Hussein, you needed us. You've got the Taliban, you, we don't need, What people need to have $2 billion a week spent on an occupation of their land? Well, we, we've got, I think, a kind of an equation that goes on wherein if the United States military and foreign policy elites can convince the population that this is a humanitarian war, then what they get in return is vast indifference. People won't pay attention to the consequences. They'll kind of be like my mother. They'll be lulled into thinking, well, by and large, it's a humanitarian war. People are better off with us than whoever the bad guys are. And it becomes like cartoons. And that's why I love that soldier that I told you about in the beginning, because he wasn't looking at cartoons. He just saw a person there. Well, we could all do that, of course, so much more. And I look to the Occupy movement and feel intense hope. I mean, I've been in high schools. Can you imagine in high schools where kids are not encouraged to stay very much on top of the news, maybe the Colbert Show once in a while? And I've asked <coughs> high schoolers, can you raise your hand if you know what 99 and 1 refers to? And all the hands in the room go up, they know. This is remarkable. And um, I, I, I can't get over in places all around the world how savvy people are. Like I said, I was in Australia, and we had a chance to have a phone call with Occupy activists in Melbourne and Oakland and New York and Kabul. And everybody was talking to each other, and they were talking about Chilean students who were occupying their schools to the tune of 600 kids who say, we're not budging because we don't want to pay those high prices for tuition. So something's happening in our globe. And I think it's a good time to be honest about how our levels of consumption and waste are woo, way over the top compared to the rest of the world. But the greatest terror we face is the threat of what we're doing to our own environment in our air pollution, in our water pollution, in our ground pollution, and I mean us. Those are the things we need the ingenuity for and the money for and the resources for to figure out how to wage that struggle with scientific smarts. We don't need more wars. And so it's my hope that Occupy can get people asking the question, what do we want to produce? Okay, you want more jobs? Great, good. But what do you want to make? Do you want to graduate from some aerospace institute and make drones? And let that be proliferation, turn the skies into areas that are filled with drones whizzing by? Because if the nuclear bomb could proliferate as fast as it did after World War II, and it went pretty fast considering it took a lot of complication, a lot of science to make a nuclear bomb. It doesn't take too much. A real estate developer out in San Francisco made his own drone and was flying it around the coast of San Francisco so he could take better panoramic shots of houses he wanted to sell. The FAA went nuts and said, hey, you can't do that. Well, he could too, he did. So, you know, fly the friendly skies. What about the unfriendly skies? What about the possibility? I mean, Israel is selling drones to China. The United States is constantly antagonizing people all around the world. Do we think that people are just going to say, ho oh, hum, and take it again and again and again? What kind of world are we giving to the children? So I want to say to every soccer mom, 
you love your children. Where are the eco moms? Let's, let's encourage that. And let's encourage that every Occupy activist try to kind of bring some friends along to that question. What do we want to produce? What kind of jobs do we want to have? And let's try to listen to these Afghan teenagers who never had electricity for a full day in their entire lives, ever, and their imprint on the world is pretty soft as things <coughs> go, but they are smart enough to know that if they engage in revenge and try to get weapons or try to become dependent on the West, that that isn't going to create a better future for them. And um, So I guess I want to just maybe take a little look at uh, some reasons when people ask us, and I know you're probably asking this yourselves, and a lot of people ask, well, why is the United States continuing in this war? What, what's the reason? I think it's a good idea to look at this map. The one country in the world, the one, sorry, the one Muslim country in the world that has the nuclear bomb is Pakistan. And notice the long border that Pakistan shares with Iran, and then the long border Pakistan shares with China. And I think it's fair to say that the United States is in a cold war with China. Nobody wants to say so because we're economically interdependent with China. But the United States doesn't want China as a developing nation, which is developing very, 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 very rapidly, to start sort of squeezing the United States out of markets. And so if we can get a leg up, if we can be more able to uh, control the pricing and the flow of resources that China desperately needs, then the United States in the geopolitical strategy of things is getting ahead. And if we can, right now we have 450 forward operating bases that are spread all throughout Afghanistan, 450. We're building the world's largest embassy, it used to be in Baghdad, but now there's going to be a bigger one in Kabul, the world's largest embassy. We have huge prisons, and the United States is putting $100 million into building another big, huge prison. Do not please ever think that the United States is pulling the troops out in 2013. That's an electioneering strategy. But the United States is pressuring President Hamid Karzai of Afghanistan right now to sign an agreement, it's called the Strategic Partnership Agreement, that will keep U.S. troops there until 2024 and beyond. What kind of troops? Joint Special Operations Forces with the drones and with forward operating bases. And so how are they going to keep all these forward operating base troops fed and watered? You know, the, the wretched refugee camp I told you about is right across the street, like we're right across the street from that building over there. This wretched refugee camp is right across the street from a huge, sprawling United States military base. And all day long, you see trucks going into the U.S. military base entrance with fuel, with food, with clean water, going right past the people that are on the brink of starvation who can't keep their kids from freezing to death. So how do they get all that stuff there? It's not being airlifted. Right now it all has to come from the north because the Pakistanis are so mad at the U.S. for killing 24 of their soldiers that the Pakistanis have closed the transport routes of the Khyber Pass and at Quetta and said, forget it. You can't bring your trucks across. And even if we said you could, people are so mad at you, they torch your own trucks. And so that's happening. The United States is paying huge amounts of money to warlords that run these roads and even more up here to try to get trucks in. And sometimes the money is going right in the pockets of drug lords and Taliban warlords. So when you ask $2 billion a week, what's it being spent on? A lot of it is being spent on getting goods and services to U.S. troops and paying the warlords that run the roadways and basically rent a stretch of road. And this has been proven by this very good congressperson, John Tierney, not once but two years in a row. He's written a very comprehensive report. He presents his report. Everybody in Congress, mm -hmm. don't want to make Halliburton angry. <laughs> don't want to alienate Boeing. So we just keep on going with the weapons and the war. So that's one map that I think is kind of a good one to look at. Um, these kids are not taking a nap. They're dehydrated. The only time I saw them upright, they were in the arms of either the grandfather in the corner or their own dad. 
And um, this little boy, you know, you ask yourself, well, who would join the Taliban? How about a child who's hungry? How about a child who doesn't get a clean change of clothes and is illiterate? And the moms, the, mo the women, will sometimes say to the men, why don't you send our young boy to study the Holy Quran and give him clean clothes and food? I mean, I do not hear me saying that the Taliban are the good guys, but they put themselves up to be like Robin Hood. And the more that people are sending out on the cell phone the message, this bloody thing happened again, the more they're going to be more anxious to send their kids to join the Taliban. And some of these kids are orphans, and they don't have anywhere else to go. And they're traumatized. And they've got a better reason to be fighting, I must say, than the United States kids who don't have any place to go and can't get into college and have been hit bad by poverty. But they haven't gone through what these kids have gone through. A lot of times if you're in a refugee camp, the kids will come running if you have a camera. Sora, Sora, they used to say in Iraq. There's not a smile on the face of a single one of these girls. They had it. And I'm sorry to say that in Pakistan, this was half of a dispensary. It was the half that wasn't in full use, but the other side was just as bad. And that's health care. So the, the province where the man who did the allegedly did this shooting spree, this Kandahar. This is the Helmand province. It's shaded in red because there's such a heavy U.S. military presence there. And I just want to mention that um, the United States, after three years and three billion dollars, finally was able to say, okay, we flushed out all the Taliban. There are no Taliban in the Garmsir district, which was home to 150,000 people total. Three billion dollars for 150,000 people? If you just took that $3 billion and divided it up between the 150,000 people, <laughs> you might have bought them off for a long time to come. Uh, it's just the, 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 the huge amounts of money that are being spent. So this was a map that was developed in 2006 by I, a, an analyst who apparently was working for the CIA, Mr. Ralph Peters. And the map on the left-hand side is telling true borders. This is really the way it looks. On the right-hand side, Mr. Peters was trying to imagine a map that would better serve the interests of the United States military and, well, the U.S. national interests, as the military would see it. And so it's not unthinkable that in Pakistan, a huge, vast area called Baluchistan would someday break away. The Pakistani government has been cruel to the Baluch tribes, and they've taken and taken and taken materials like natural gas, and they don't give back, and there have been Baluchi <coughs> uprisings and torture and imprisonment. So Mr. Peters just kind of imagined, what if Baluchistan broke away? Well, that would cut off the long border with Iran. And then he just kind of imagined, what if Afghanistan kind of whoop, carved over and cut off the border with China? So then you've got the one Muslim country that has the nuclear bomb isolated in terms of borders from China and Pakistan. And then what if it kind of, if Afghanistan sort of moved over and went right past the place where the nuclear bombs are stored? So what I can tell you, this map is old. It was made in 2006. But when I was in Pakistan, every, and I mean every, 201 educated, affluent person who spoke English had seen this map and said, yes, believe me, Madame Kathy, we think this will be our future. So why is the United States over there? You know, we, I can say if these 100,000 analysts are studying maps and studying what the drones feed them, we should study too. And maybe this map here we could call Pipelinistan. And I think it, got, it gives quite a lot of insight. Um, this is the Caspian Sea. And in the Caspian Sea basin is a very concentrated reserve of natural gas and fossil fuels. Now, it isn't that the United States wants to take natural gas and fossil fuels from the Caspian Sea and put it in our tanks and stuff, no. But China and Russia could be expected to want to be able to avail themselves of these resources. And if the United States controls the pipeline and is now also wanting to build what Hillary Clinton calls the New Silk Road, 
then future resources to be discovered, like lithium and precious minerals, can be gotten out of Afghanistan, but it'll count on the United States, everybody will count on the United States to be the conduit, the transportation conduit. And so in 2010, in Lisbon, Spain, the NATO countries met, and they were so pleased because the Asia Development Bank said, we'll sign on the dotted line, we'll bankroll this pipeline. Unical started it back in the 90s when Hamid Karzai worked for them, and now it's getting under construction again. So this is, I think, extremely important. The United States wants to not secure a better future for Afghan women, they're not trying to get health security or water security or food security or electrical security to people in Afghanistan. They want to secure the pipeline so they can be the robbers and control everything and say to China and to say to Russia, we're in charge. But it's never going to work. It's over. The United States has got to go into the future that we're really moving into. We're not the sole superpower. Brazil, Russia, India, China, the BRIC powers, the Shanghai Cooperation Unit. You know, it's, <laughs> the gig's kind of up for other countries saying, mm -hmm. we can bully Afghanistan. We can probably bully Iran. But we're not bullying Russia and China. And I sound like a street tough talking this way, and I don't want to talk this way. I want to be influenced by these wonderful young Afghan youth peace volunteers. But I also want to say it's okay to combine anger and agitation and clear thought. You know, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King put it this way. He said, you've got to have tough minds and tender hearts. A tender heart for every U.S. soldier killed, for every CIA analyst killed. A tender heart for every family that's got arms aching for a loved one they're not sure will return. A tender heart for everybody working in the State Department in the CIA, in the Pentagon. But tough minds to say, we don't want to be a train that's going to go over an abyss. We want to put our brakes on that train, or get off the train, or don't pay so much for that train. So these Afghan kids, when they really went out on a limb with risky activity, decided to walk arm in arm kind of reminded me of Martin Luther King and the white civil rights activists and the rabbis and the Buddhist monk, you know, everybody's <laughs> walking, singing, we shall overcome. They wore sky blue scarves and they walked arm in arm, Tajik, Hazara, Uzbek, Pashto, I mean, this never happens. And it was a defiance to all the warlords. And they walked down the streets of Kabul. It was a very dangerous thing to do. One house was burnt down, death threats were issued. And I asked this one young girl, Shahar Bono, why did you pick Sky Blue? <clears throat> and she looked at me as kind of incredulous. She said, oh, because Madame Kathy, there is one blue sky over all of us. And so I'll just close with Pete Seeger's very beautiful lines. My voice is kind of hoarse and raspy, so forgive that. But it's a little lullaby for Lindsay. Are you still with me, Lindsay? <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, what? I lost her ages ago. One blue sky above us, one ocean lapping at our shore, one earth so green and round, who could ask for more? And because I love you, I'll give it one more try to tell our rainbow earth it's too soon to die. Pete Sigger had it right. Thank you. So, if anybody wants to run away, come to Madison. <laughs> We're going to walk from Madison to Chicago, May 1st to 17th. If you can't walk from Madison to Chicago, if you don't want to walk to Chicago, <laughs> come to Chicago. Won't you please come to Chicago? <laughs> Uh, I don't know what's going to happen. And personally, I can't wait for it all to be over with. Um, but NATO is going to be there and should be protested. Uh, the decisions NATO has made have been so wrongful and prolonged wars and become like the military global cops for the world. So please do think about coming to Chicago. Uh, the Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers are uh, looking to have two million 
candles lit on Human Rights Day, December 10th, International Human Rights Day. So there's some months to organize this. I said, two million is kind of a lot, but we were in touch with people from India. And one out of every six people on the planet lives in India. And these Indian people said, we can help you do this. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> we can help too. Uh, so please think about your Springfield gathering, where it will be, and what time on December 10th, and get as many candles as you can. You can get the ones from those little stores that have the glass jar ones, you know. Just scrape off the religious stuff if you want. Uh, anyway. <laughs> so candlelit vigils, December 10th, um, and then we'll keep a, 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 a web-based database or something. And they're not going to have me do it, I'll tell you that. Um, and then. Um, we also uh, really encourage, if you can, to get involved with the, every 21st of each month, the Global Days of Listening. And you can listen to the Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers talk for themselves. They, the, Hakeem does the translating. And just go to um, globaldaysoflistening.com and you can get hooked into that. And I also hope you'll get a chance to look at their website. And uh, it's. Uh, our, our, our journey to smile and you can get these you can look at these videos yourself and they've got a hundred of them I especially like the one with this little girl and then um, another one is called why not dance and it's more recent and it shows these Afghan kids going through this rather long winter uh, so um, please come to Chicago if you can anytime we're right off the Argyle L stop red line and you'd be very welcome to drop in stay as long as you like and if you Stick around, you can become a co-coordinator, that's all it takes. <laughs> Heidi didn't believe me, but <laughs> ask anybody there, you walk in the door and stick around, you're a co-coordinator of Voices for Creative Now. <laughs> so we're very serious, we're very, very, very serious. We, we, most of us have spent time in prison, so we're a bunch of ex-cons. We keep our salary under the taxable income because we don't want to pay for war. And um, we really hope the federal government doesn't raid our home office <laughs> where we all live. Um, and. Uh, I also, I, you know, especially when I'm sort of in this part of the world where so much of the, the Civil War played out, um, I wonder how much did abolitionists know regarding how close they were to putting an end to slavery. And I mean, I don't mean to say we put an end to racism or that there isn't a reenactment of slavery going on in many ways, that's true. But we're not out at the marketplace buying and selling human beings on a Saturday morning. And the abolitionists, maybe couldn't know how close they were getting. And I don't think we know how close we might be getting to a tipping point where we might put an end to war. And people all around the world would collectively realize, for their young, it's too soon to die. So thank you for listening and have a good night. And if anybody's got time to hang around for questions and answers, that's great with me. I'm sorry I don't have an off switch. Um, but shall we? Close, and then those who want to stay longer could do that. Yeah, that? just based on um, the program that you did last night, somebody had a really good question. Well, if not war, what? If not war, what? So if you could share. Some yeah. Time. Well, um, you know, some people say, you want to end the war, bring back the draft. And I have an answer to that. I think, okay, start with 40 and up. <laughs> <laughs> now, start with 40 and up. Okay, let's stay with that a little longer. I've had such a good life. I mean, I've lived in the part of the planet where, you know, I, I'm not melting snow on a normal day to try to figure out if I can get my waste material flushed down a hole. And I can have whatever I want to eat and turn on the lights and have electricity and education and transportation and, you know, you name it. So I've had this very good life. What if people like us, those of us who've had good lives and have a lot to kind of give back, said, send us. Don't send people armed and ready to kill. Don't send protective drones and helicopters and F-16s and 500-pound bombs. Send the people that say, we don't believe in that stuff. Now, you might say, but I went to Sarajevo back in 1991 while that war was raging. And for the four days that we were there, the bombs stopped and the guns stopped. And I thought, oh, we should stay longer. Um, and I watched and I, I paid a lot of attention to that war. And you know, the map that finally did get negotiated out of the Dayton Accords was worse for the Muslims 
than the one that had been proposed three years earlier. And it was the US who said, oh, don't sign that map. We'll get you a better deal. Huh. I wouldn't trust the warlords from any country to get any of us a better deal through warfare. Uh, whether it's Libya or Syria. I mean, one of my housemates just married a woman from Syria, and my heart breaks for her right now. She's just you know, right with her family, and they're at risk. But I, I myself am not ready to say, so gee, I want the United States to go in there with guns blazing and helicopters bombing. I don't believe that it brings about a safer situation. I think that as soon as the other side can rearm, they'll go right back shooting again. Negotiation, diplomacy, and then, you know, taking this huge amount of resource and energy and money that's spent on the warlords, whether they're the big ones from the United States and China and Russia, and spending that on helping people meet their human needs. Because so often what drives people to be part of uprisings and armed uprisings is because they can't figure out how to feed their families. And so to share resources more radically, to live more simply, to really believe that nonviolence can change the world, to never, ever, ever let inconvenience get in the way of acting in accord with our deepest beliefs, and to always try to put the poorest, the most impoverished as number one, number one, top, 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 number one priority. Those would be the ways that I would answer what to do in terms of intervention. But the idea that you have to oh, send the Marines, send the trained warriors, because that's, all, that's the best we can come up with, I, I don't believe it. Um, so I, I think it's, it's hard to say to people, well, how about sending unarmed people? But, okay, I've been with small teams in Gaza while the bombs were falling. Once every 11 minutes, a bomb fell. And when you've been under those bombs and you've, you know, it was the kids who were able to tell me, oh, that was a 500-pound bomb that was dropped by a F-15 fighter plane, and that was a helicopter that just shot, an Apache helicopter that just shot a Hellfire missile. And that's the sound of the drone, and it's getting closer, and that means it might hit us next. I mean, I'm not a missiles expert or a ballistics expert. I wouldn't have known any of that on my own. The kids sorted it out for me. Now, is that the kind of world we want? Because that's what happens when you go in with the weaponry. And the United States has intervened again and again and again and said, we've got the weapons, we've got NATO, we've got whatever coalition they want to form up. And I don't believe that that's ultimately what can solve the problems. So I was glad for that question last night. Sir? Well, since uh, you know, Gaddafi has been deposed in Libya, we don't really hear much about what's going on in Libya. Do you know uh, what's, what the situation is over there? Well, now? some UN people are now saying that people that were former government are being tortured hideously inside of clandestine prisons, and there is some human rights um, commotion being stirred. It's true, we don't know much, or are people going to get a better deal? I, I, I don't know, but... Um, you have to, are there elections planned, or what? Well, I don't know. I mean, in Egypt, it, it took a while, and it's interesting that the Muslim Brotherhood would not have been the ones the United States wanted to see in ascendance. So who knows what will happen in Libya. Uh, Tunisia kind of held their own with their Arab Spring. They're hard questions, but I would not entrust answers to the militaries. And then keep the golden rule. If we don't want it for us, would we recommend it for others? But I really do think uh, the idea of going into war zones unarmed is an untapped possibility. And, you know, Gandhi thought that his whole world had fallen apart. Muslims are slaughtering Sikhs. Sikhs are killing Hindus. Hindus are killing Muslims. And this is utterly the opposite of what Gandhi had tried to work for in this liberation of his country. And the liberation has happened, and they've been liberated into a nightmare. And so what could he do? Poor little Gandhi, you know, he's about my size. And this is what he did. He said to his followers, okay, only one. One person <coughs> per village. And you get to that village and you move in and you take the risk that they might kill you because you might not be the person they want to see and hold meetings, clean up the debris, bury the dead, 
and then go on to the next village. And so over a 116-day period, Gandhi and his Satyagrahis went to 47 villages. And this was all in this northeast area of India. And the fighting stopped. They had people signing pledges. And then they went to Bihar. And then they went to Calcutta. And they were going to go to Delhi. And one of the Hindi nationalists said, this is going too far, and killed Gandhi. But, you know, Gandhi did not, and that's in our time, you know, it's not something we sort of speculate about. We can watch this on TV, you know. Gandhi did it. He didn't go in with Humvees and armored personnel carriers and helicopters and jeeps. And you can see this lone figure in the sunlight walking with a little knapsack over his back on bamboo bridges that are strung between the treetops. And people see this guy coming and think, oh, shit. <laughs> Let's just hear what he has to say. And they put down the weapons. So it's not outlandish to think this way. But we need charismatic leadership. Now, Occupy might supply charismatic leadership in the thousands. You know, I don't know if it has to be one named person. But we need charisma, we need leadership, we need hope that there can be an alternative. But at least we need to put on the brakes, you know, before that train goes boom, right over the abyss. <laughs> because that's how irrational it is to keep up with our military stratagems. It's like a train that's about to go over. And the most, instead of saying, but we like the observation deck, it's a good view. We act like big children. The government wants us to act like big children. That's why they're always saying, ah! Watch this, it's the Oscars. Watch this, it's the Emmys. Watch this, it's the Grammys. Watch this, it's football. Watch this, it's baseball. Watch this, it's Kate Middleton's wedding dress. What kind of nuts are we? I mean, we, 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 we belong to a country that fought a revolution to say there's no such thing as royal blood, and you've got the whole country enamored with Kate Middleton's wedding dress. She gives a talk and... <laughs> um... I don't know, we sort of are bamboozled into acting like big children. And we need adults. You know, and that's not even starting with all the people who, as soon as their kids get home from school, they're off to the soccer field, they're off to the piano lesson, they're off to the horseback riding, they're off to, you know, the helicopter moms are woo, with their kids 24-7, it seems. No wonder if people don't have time to read the newspaper. When I was going to Gaza, you know, I try to tell my family what I'm going to do. And so I said to my sister, I'm, I'm about to go to Gaza. And she said, Gaza. And I realized she, nothing was registered. I said, well, it's kind of near the Mediterranean. And she said, ah, oh, can't, that's great. You're going to take a cruise. You have a wonderful time, honey. You really deserve it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and that's America. <laughs> Gaza, Mediterranean. They don't know where places are. And I was the same way. And I can't name all the capitals of Africa, not in a... Not in an hour I got to study to get it down pat. But people just don't know about the world we actually inhabit. 